So, Connor, welcome to MBA Without BS. It's great having you here. Michael, thank you for having me on here. So this time, we are not going to start with you the way we start with every guest. I am making a very specific exemption. So this is a special situation. I'm going to start with you with an apology because an apology is due. I have scheduled this interview twice and for whatever reason, didn't make it twice and wasted Connor's time. And at the second time, he said, you know what, man, some things are not meant to be, you know, it's fine. No hard feelings. I'm like, I, you're so right. I apologize. You're so right. And we left it with that. But then a friend of mine, uh, maybe hopefully also Connor's at one day, Brian Golod, published a post. I don't even remember what it was about. And I just read the post and I said, I have to apologize right now publicly to get it out of my you know, system because I was so embarrassed. I actually hired an assistant to help me with scheduling after doing this twice. So I issued a public apology and I was lucky enough for Connor to see it and say, hey man, you know what? I appreciate the gesture. It's all right. Let's do this a third time. And well, the third time was a charm. Michael, you know, one of the things that I've learned in, in the recent period of my life, because I, I think what you need to be good at at 20 is different than what you need to be good at at 30 and 40. And, and you know, sometimes the way I look at a career and the typical MBA career, uh, I, I teach in an MBA program here at ESA in, in Barcelona. And I think you know, from 20 to 30, really being efficient, being good at what your boss asks you to do is the most important thing. Mm. So being efficient, not letting your boss down, getting good work done, but you don't need to worry too much about what work you should be doing. As long as you're kind of impressing one person and you're pretty efficient, you'll get from 20 to 30, you'll make your promotions. From 30 to 40, that's gonna to stop to work. Because being efficient on the wrong things, being efficient on unimportant projects begins to be a real liability. So that the second skill that steps into a career from 30 to 40 years old is impact, is not working on any project, but identifying which projects really are gonna have an impact that will get you noticed. So you know, if you're in a high growth company and you're in accounting, you got to be really sure that there's some senior leaders that care deeply about this. Otherwise, you're not going to have an impact. Uh, and it's, it's actually quite a difficult switch for someone who's been very good at being efficient, but has never taken time to think about what projects you should be working on. And, and very often, an MBA program hits in this transition. So you know, in, in Barcelona, in, in the ESA MBA program, the average age would be 28, 29 years old. And, and it's sort of that critical transformation from being really good at what's in front of you. And you need to come out, come out of an MBA with an ability to go, well, hang on, let me take a bit of time at the beginning of the week on a Sunday just to think, what's important? What, what, what do the senior people here care about? What are the sort of things that I should be putting my time and energy in that perhaps my boss doesn't realize, but I need to start to pay attention that they are important. Uh, so you know, from 30 to 40, what gives you success, success in your career is impact. It's choosing to work on projects that have significant impact on, on numbers or outcomes that really matter to the most senior leaders. And from... 40, you know, where, where are we at? This is 20 to 30 performance, <laughs> 30 to 40 performance on what delivers impact, 40 on to have success, 40 on to move up into the C-level roles, to move up into the senior leadership in a consulting organization or a bank. It's now not enough to be efficient. It's not enough to just choose wisely with impact. You need to generate exposure. Mm. And exposure, uh, for me, the, the story that most captures this, this uh, ability to have high performance, ability to do things with impact, but have no exposure, 
a good friend of mine. We started work around the same time back in Accenture in 1995. Uh, and my friend, when he was working at a large British utility and had an opportunity to interview for marketing director globally for this utility. And he'd been in the company leading a lot of programs for eight or nine years. He was on the short list for global marketing director. And he was called for an interview with the global CEO of the business. And he remembers coming into this amazing office and uh, the receptionist asking, would he like a coffee? And he was sat in, in this sort of sitting room area of the office. And the CEO came over and sat with him and said, you know, did you get some coffee? Do you need anything? And, and my friend, you know, had spent a couple of days really getting ready for this conversation. This was make or break. The CEO's first statement was, you've been here for eight years. And he said, yeah, yeah. Why don't I know you? Mm -hmm. And he had no answer. <laughs> and you know, from 40 onwards, you need to create the opportunity that senior people get to know you. And you, you've got to figure out how that's done. And, and I think you know, some of the challenges I find in, in teaching on an MBA program, I, I teach at, at the ESA Business School on the MBA program, the Executive MBA program, the Global Executive MBA program, Senior Leaders program. So average age MBA 28, average age executive MBA 34, 35, average age Gemba 40, average age senior leaders 55, 60. Wow. And it's incredible the change in attitude, life energy, awareness of what's important at each of these stages. Very often a question I'll get in an MBA program is some of the high performing students will come up to me and say, uh, Professor Neil, Professor Neil, um, what do I need to do to get an A on your subject? And I tell them, stop worrying about grades. Focus on developing what you need to develop for your leadership. And they look back at me with a frustrated and annoyed <laughs> stare. On the executive MBA, I'll never get that question. They're not so worried about grades. They're worried about building bonds with those around them, building connections. And they realize getting an A but pissing off everyone around you is the worst thing that you can do. If you leave an MBA program with 250 people that respect you, trust your honesty, trust your perspective, know that you'll be kind, but you'll be honest and harsh if necessary, and that they can trust your word, that's going to transform the rest of your life. You come out on an MBA program and you've got the best grades of everyone and everyone else thinks you're an arse, you have fundamentally failed in the key goal of an MBA program. An MBA program, you walk out, and, and over the next 30 years, your peers are going to move into some key decision roles around the world. You know, you, you do an MBA at Harvard, you do an MBA at Stanford, London Business School, INSEAD, ESA. You just have to wait because your peers are gonna move into positions where they can take decisions, positions where they have resources, positions where they can open doors. And, and if you've built bonds as a trustworthy human being that brings your own perspective, that resource is far, far, far more important than getting six A's in your first term subjects. And you know, I guess one of the difficulties is someone who gets into an MBA program is very likely someone who did very well at school, did got the job that they wanted. Well, here's an exception. I agree with you. So yeah, I'm, I'm being stereotypes yeah. and stereotypes <laughs> are a dangerous thing. Uh, yeah. One of the approaches I take within the MBA is, you know, I, I think the world is broken down into, a, B, and C players. And, mm -hmm. and this is context and timing. It doesn't mean that an A player will always be an A player. You know, I think Mike, Michael Jordan, I just watched this, these 
this Netflix documentary, The Last Dance. Yeah, outstanding. Uh, outstanding. And, and I lived in Chicago in, in 1985, oh. 86, 87, oh, the beginning wow. of Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen. So yeah, it was something special for me to watch it. And, you know, Michael Jordan on a basketball court was, you know, something beyond an A player, a triple A player, a, a, a franchise making individual. You know, Chicago is a broken team. And, and it's so rare to have a player who is so strong and so committed that they can come into a team that is broken, that has a horrible culture. And, and their work ethic and their attitude turns the whole environment around. That is so rare. But you know, when, when Michael went to baseball, he wasn't the best on the team. Uh, he needed others to be the franchise maker. So you know, an A player is an A player in a certain context and at a certain time. Uh, but you know, in, in any business, there's going to be a couple of people that if you can get them on your side, you can change the world. And, and my... Uh, after 18 years of being an entrepreneur, and I think the single most important skill of an entrepreneur is attracting, picking, motivating, uh, and helping great people engage with your vision and bring their I ha- best. I have to pause you here. I have to pause you here. First, because I couldn't agree more. But second, because you went through, you know, discussing the 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, which I, you know, makes tons of sense. But on, I know your story. And so I would like to ask you to tell us, like we do with every guest, tell us your story in preferably two minutes or under. And you can, you can pause where it doesn't correlate with the, the 20 to 30, 30 to 40, because you basically did it kind of upside down, broke, you know, all the all the barriers, you know, and then, okay, I'm, I'm going to let you tell the story, but it became immensely successful and then flunked and then, but didn't understand. What, okay. I'm going to let you tell the story. Yeah. And you know, there, I was very good at getting the right grades for the subjects I cared about in school. Mm. And and I brought that skill set to my first job. I joined Accenture at the time, Anderson Consulting, and and I was pretty good at, at programming and delivering what my boss wanted. So, you know, from twenty through to twenty five, you put me on a project, and the boss will love me. Mm. And you know, I spent eight years in in Accenture in London in Chicago and three years in Sydney. Uh, and then I did an MBA. And when I finished MBA, I, I did my MBA in Barcelona at ESA Business School. When I finished the MBA, I had the choice of going to London, returning to Accenture, joining Accenture in Spain or something else. Hmm. And I remember thinking, my, my, I wanted to live in Spain. So going back to London seemed like a, a step backwards. Accenture in Spain has a different culture. It's, you arrive earlier than your boss, you stay later than your boss. And I was aware that if I joined you know, in my ninth year of my career and I knew nobody, I would get all the crappiest projects for the next couple of years. So if I was to join Accenture in Spain, I would have no one protecting me from the crappy jobs that no one else wanted to go to. And a a friend of mine from my MBA said that she and her father and two partners were going to buy a bankrupt business. And there was a lot of technology. Would I help them just understand the technology that they were acquiring? I worked for a month on on a project. And at the end of the month, I said, could I buy some of this company? So I found myself a couple of months after my MBA owning 20% of an insurance brokerage. And in a year or two, we became number three online sales of home, auto, life and health insurance in Spain. This is back in 2005, six um, and then I set up another business, which was purchasing business. 
And I started to think, you know, I've, I've got this entrepreneurship <laughs> stuff down. And I ran my, the businesses that I founded like a manager from Accenture, like someone who just values performance. And I, you know, my, my fourth business, so my plan as an entrepreneur was start four businesses and sell each one for 10 times what I'd sold the previous one, which would put me uh, at age 42 with 30 million in my bank account. That was the aim. So I had 15 years to set up four businesses and sell each one for 10 times the previous one. And, you know, the, the part of the story I shared before, by 2008, uh, this plan was working. Hmm. Uh, I was on my fourth business. We had set up a net jet style uh, private jet operator in Spain. I had sold 16 aircraft and we were in the news. I was on television. I was the foreign entrepreneur making it good in the Spanish ecosystem, transforming air travel for Spain. And July 2008, I had an offer on my desk to buy my business for 10 million from Gester, the biggest Spanish operator of private aircraft. And I did not sign because mm -hmm. I thought we are worth 10 times this. 15th September, 2008, Lehman Brothers declared bankruptcy. Uh, our plane stopped flying. Uh, by February 2009, I had to lay off all of the pilots, all of the maintenance staff, all of our commercial team. And you know, just day after day, I couldn't believe this was happening to me. This shouldn't be happening to me. I didn't deserve this. I'd not done anything wrong. I'd not cheated anyone. And by March 2009, uh, my ex-wife had said, I can't do this. Uh, you need to leave. So March 2009, no money in my bank account. Uh, you know, thinking I, I've got an MBA. I've got a good degree. I've worked at a top consulting company. It doesn't happen to people like me. Someone like me doesn't end up with no cash. But far worse than the financial was going to bed at each night and knowing that my daughter was under another roof. And, and I think this in 2009 was a thing I couldn't handle. The thought that it felt to me like I was the first of all the generations of my family to fail to provide the basic of a home to my daughter. And it was an agony. The money I could get back, the business I could build back, but I could never ever live up to the ideal that I had of what a good father would give to their kid. Uh, and yeah, I remember when I was young, I, I felt my dad wasn't really there. I can be a better dad. At 2009, it's like, you're a worse dad than your own dad. Yeah, your dad gave you a home. Your dad gave you stability. Yeah, you screwed up. And my attitude in 2009 was not, you've screwed up. My attitude was, this has been done to me. This has been done to me by my investors, by the owners, by the world. And yeah, I think towards the end of 2009, a friend of mine dragged me to a course in London called The Breakthrough Experience with a guy, Dr. John Demartini. And I remember the beginning of the course, Dr. John Demartini asks you to write a list, a list of names, the people with whom you have the largest negative emotional charge. So who do you think really has, has cheated you, let you down, not been there when you needed them? And back in 2009, I had a long list. And, you know, probably up top of that list, ex-wife, my father, uh, investors, some of the early employees. And Dr. John Martini said, you need to pick one. And we're going to work on that one. And at the time, I was still a unrepentant consultant who thought I was more efficient than anyone else. And I said, yeah, I I'm faster than most people. Can I do two? So just pick one. <laughs> and at 4 a.m. on a Saturday night, I came out of the room. There's probably 60 of us on this course who went through a process. And part of it was just coming to an acceptance that nothing is done to you. There's an opportunity to learn in everything that happens to you. 
And I think, you know, the, the person that came out of that course, I, mean, I think that course just came at the right time in my life. That, mm. that something had happened that was so outside my ability to understand. And, and you know, when I talk about those three phases of, you know, first, just being really efficient at whatever's in front of you. You don't really need to worry about where you're going. Just make good steps. I was really good at that. And, and there's a lot of people in the world that are really good at taking good steps, but they've got no idea where they're going. Hmm. And you know, the, the, the deal I had in my, in my head with life was if I sacrifice a lot and I walk really fast and I'm really efficient, the world owes me to be wealthy. And I'm willing to sacrifice today and tomorrow and the next 15 years of my life but the deal is that there should be 30 million in my bank account for giving up so much, sacrificing so much and being really efficient at it. You know, you gave me anything when I was 25, 28, 32, I would get the document written faster than anyone. I would get the program written faster than anyone. I was really efficient and I thought that was all that matters. I also thought that I knew better than everyone else around me, that I, knew enough to know what was right and what was wrong. Um, for me, you know, one, one story that, that resonates with this, I, you know, in, in the years after in mm -hmm. 2008, 2009, I, I had a few years of really stopping and putting myself back together. And in, in some ways I lived as a hermit. Uh, I had a little house in the Costa Brava right on the beach and 2010, 11, 12, probably spent 20 weeks of any given year just alone on the beach up about an hour and a half from Barcelona and reading and thinking and reflecting and coming to terms with, with like what happened and who am I and where am I going? And it you know, grew to regret a lot of the ways I approached life. Uh, you know, one is I didn't forgive anyone. You know, if, if, if you'd been three minutes late on me back when I was running taxi jet, the airline, like, how dare you do that to me? Don't you know who I am? Hmm. Post 2009, you know, most of the time I put myself in a good state of mind, which is I'll bring a book and I'll bring my notebook. And if someone arrives late, I'll be writing, I'll be reading, I'll use the time effectively. I think, you know, what has happened to me, these last 12 weeks of coronavirus and quarantine, it kind of pushed me off balance a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the last two weeks was, was the beginning of opening up after a very strict lockdown here in Spain. And uh, we had 43 days that I didn't leave the four walls of this apartment. So there was one five minute trip to put the garbage out in the bin. But other than that, I was here. And about three weeks ago, there was a slight opening and you could begin to go out and do exercise in the morning. You could go out with your kids at a certain time. So I, I think, you know, when we had our uh, time slot uh, mismanagement, it, it, it wasn't in a perfect world. It was in a world where there were, there were certain hours that myself and my four-year-old daughter could head out on the bicycle and certain hours that if you missed it, you just can't. Uh, and I, I, I think, you know, there's, there's, a couple of habits that really keep me sane. One of which is going for long runs. Mm. And, and it, it needs to be a long run where there's no traffic lights stopping you. Uh, and at the moment, I'm not allowed to go where I usually go. So I can run along a route that has lots of traffic lights, but I don't get the sense of clarity. Because when I run for an hour, an hour and a half, the clarity comes when I just stop I forget about everything and I'm just running and my body is just moving. When I run here along the streets, you're paying attention to people and passing and the lights and what's going on. Right. Do you, do so you get the you, same with a treadmill, by the way? No. For me, so here in Barcelona, there, there's a mountain behind Barcelona called Tibidabo. And yeah. along Tibidabo, there's a, a running biking track called Carretera de las Aguas. And for me, that track... If I run along there, you know, one, 
I have an incredible sense of gratitude to live where I live. And, you know, after 20 minutes running on that track, I look at Barcelona down behind me, the Mediterranean, the, I'm in the pine forest. And it's just a feeling of like, I live in such an amazing place. Like how lucky I am to be here. And, and the second is the first 20 minutes of any run for me is my head thinking of a thousand little urgent things that I've forgotten to do, that I screwed up on, that I should have done. Uh, and you know, sometimes I almost feel the need to stop, pull out my mobile phone and, and deal with them. <laughs> yep. I know the but feeling. If I can, yeah, <laughs> if I can get beyond the 20 minutes at the beginning of a run and just get into a rhythm where my legs are just starting to run, I'm starting to feel a bit of uh, heavy breathing, uh, even starting to listen to my brain say, come on, why are you running so hard? Chill out. You ran before. Calm down. If I can get through that, where I just accept I'm running, and my brain gives up and stops trying to talk me out of it and stops trying to tell me all the things I should go home and fix and pull out the mobile and do, and then I got clear on what's important. Uh, and I think it's a very important part of my life I don't run for the fitness. I run because I guess it, in some ways it's a meditation that helps me get clear on what's truly important. Hmm. And, and those three phases, you know, 20 to 30, just performance, I didn't need to go running. Hmm. You know, I had some good bosses that, that made sure I was working on running. good stuff. <laughs> running, yeah. Uh, you know, from 30 to 40, I, I, I guess always been able to speak in a way that catches the attention of others that uh, uh, you know and i think part of it is unless i can understand something in simple terms i don't feel i understand it hmm. so i've never allowed myself to have a complex understanding of something i need for myself to be able to explain things simply uh but for me, running what it helps is is this thing of impact and exposure like who really could make a difference for the next 10, 15 years? Who do I want to help? Who do I want to build a relationship with? What do they need from me? How can I help them become more clear on who they are and where they're going? And you know, what are the three things that really matter? Uh, and I love you know, Jim Collins for me, uh, one of the books here behind me, Good to Great, was to me, it's, it's the best business book I've ever read. Uh, there's others that perhaps have, have uh, more clear, but it was the first one that I read that I thought, ah, there is something about good leadership in business. And there, are, there there's a recipe and a way of approaching it. And, you know, th this idea that a great leader, you know, a great manager is really efficient. A great leader doesn't have, you don't have to be efficient. No. You got to be doing the right things and going slowly in the right direction is far, far more important than being really efficient in multiple directions or being really efficient in the wrong direction. I, th and I think you mentioned in our conversation a, a, a phrase that for me connect, like in the back of my head, that's what I think of when you speak right now. And that is that entrepreneurship, although you can substitute it with other words, but that entrepreneurship is, you know, the samurai way of life for this generation. And a samurai doesn't have to do it fast or slow. He just needs to do it, you know, zen. Well, the, yeah, the, this idea that a samurai takes complete responsibility for their life, for their relationships. And you, to me, an entrepreneur, once you realize what you've got yourself into, you realize mm -hmm. I am fundamentally responsible for providing value to the world. And, and, and value isn't what I think is value. Value is what I get paid for. Uh, and to me, the, you know, the only demonstration that your business or your product or your coaching or your service is of value to another is that they give you something of, of value to them in return. Uh, if you've got a million people that, that follow you, but they don't give you anything in return, they don't really pay attention. Uh, a good friend of mine says, he's a lawyer. He says, uh, he gives a lot of people advice the only people that really take it and take action upon it are those that pay him. Hmm. So, uh, you know, an entrepreneur is, there's no excuse. 
Uh, and, and to me, that can be hard at times. Uh, I think you know, it, the different companies I set up, the first company that I became a, a fully fledged entrepreneur, there was five of us. And I don't think I could have been a sole entrepreneur mm. as my first adventure. Uh, the idea that if I had a bad day, there were four others that would be selling. If I had a bad week, there were four others that were selling. So I could probably have a few bad weeks and there'd still be money. My second company, there was four. My third company, there was three partners. And mm -hmm. my current company, there is one single 100% owner. I have uh, to ask though, you know, I'm, I'm looking at you our, to our listeners who might not be seeing this on video. Behind you, there is a frame that has YouTube's logo on it. And I think academically speaking, you're probably one of the most successful academics, professors, also entrepreneurs, but you know, you're a YouTube sensation in education. And how does that correlate with what you just mentioned? You know, having so many followers yet, how do you get... How do you provide, how do you know that you're providing value if you, I'm not sure how they pay for it? Yeah. Well, you, you know, YouTube does pay for it. I That's guess, true. Each, each individual, and I guess I'm not exactly clear on the entire mechanics, but <laughs> you know, advertisers pay for their eyeballs. So, so money does come. But, you know, I think, that, you know, two things that, you know, the first why I began on YouTube was, it was a cheaper, simpler way of sharing videos of my speeches with conference organizers. And mm. I uploaded a couple of clips from some conferences where I spoke only to save money in sending DVDs to conference organizers. <laughs> and after a couple of years, I had 42,000 subscribers. I had never intended uh, and, you know, the first time I realized that that was a significant thing was I was teaching a group of entrepreneurs in Washington uh, and a couple of them were YouTube influencers. And they said, you know, so you know, do, you, do you do anything on this? And one of them looked at my channel and was like, holy crap, you've got, and I think at the time it was 42,000 subscribers. Uh, so, you know, that was, I think I just started with videos so early that... You know, so my first thing on YouTube was get there early. The second bit for me for YouTube was, you know, I guess I realized if I'm in hospital and I'm sick, uh, there's going to be five people come and visit me. Not 100,000, not 500,000. There's going to be five people come and visit me. And I need to make sure that whatever I do on YouTube for 200,000 or 300,000 subscribers, I never forget that the most important relationships are going to be the five people that would come and be at my side when I'm sick, when I can't do anything. And, you know, in, in some way, there's a paradox of you've got to act like it's not important, but allow it to be important. So, uh, you know, to me, yes, it does serve my ego to watch the subscriber numbers go up. But I try and tell my soul as often as possible, the, the size of that number is irrelevant if I screw up the relationship with my two daughters. The size of that number is totally irrelevant if I have not got a good relationship with my wife. The size of that number is irrelevant if I haven't got a bond with my father and my mother and my brothers and two or three friends that, that are going to be there. And, you, you know, I guess an influencer, it, it's so easy that your ego gets pulled in and addicted to the scale and the numbers. Uh, but, you know, your life is the five people you spend most time with, the five most yep. significant people. Uh, and, you know, the, probably in YouTube, I, I, I do get addicted to looking at the numbers growing at times. And, and it's probably the lower my self-esteem, the greater the addiction to looking at numbers growing. Uh, but I know, and I put as much systems in place to say that is not important. It's, you know, 5, 10, 20 people in your life 
if you can get those relationships good. And then, you know, what I want to share on, on YouTube, I, I, I go in wild swings between I should do a Google search for all the most search for terms and produce content that will attract eyeballs. And I think you map it, you're doing it again. You've fallen into the ego search for views. What I told myself years ago is social media, my blog, my YouTube channel is to help me on a journey of learning. So my YouTube channel, uh, if you look at the original name for it, it's called the rhetorical journey. Mm -hmm. And the rhetorical journey is something that I heard in an interview with you two when I was mm -hmm. 13 years old. On one of the albums of you two, there's an interview between a journalist and the edge and the journalist asks the edge of you two you know each album is a, is a new different type of music you know how does you two you know keep exploring how, how do you not just repeat the same and the edge says we're on a rhetorical journey and i remember hearing that when i was 12 13 years old at our summer house in the countryside of ireland i think what is a rhetorical journey and a rhetorical journey is is a journey you go on to search for your own meaning and yeah you know, i've loved you two all my life and i think they have some very clear beliefs about the role that they want to play which is not just to be famous musicians but to use that platform to make a difference in what they care about uh, and use their music to explore ideas to, to not just give people what they've loved before but it, but allow people to explore with them so you know my youtube channel is i i fall into the i should just look up some bunch of titles and produce content on what's being searched for i think no my youtube channel is my own tool for learning for reflecting on my own life on what i'm going through and you know, that, that it resonates with some others. I, th I think I need other people to listen to me and to enter into dialogue for me to learn. Uh, and, and to be honest, this last 12 weeks, I've been starved of the experience of standing up in a class mm. and having motivated, intelligent, uh, driven, engaged people in dialogue. Uh, because, you know, this conversation is good, but it's... I'm used to 70 people in an MBA classroom or, you know, 200, Energy. 200 and, and, and there's a, there's a dialogue going on. Yeah. And I find that that process of dialogue is where I learn the most and get clear on what's important. And what YouTube does is it enhances the quality of the other conversations. So now when I teach on an MBA program or executive MBA program, there's not going to be anyone in the room that needs the intro to Connor. So we're going to go straight into the deep conversation. We don't need an hour of intro to persuasive communication or intro to Aristotle's approach to, to understanding the world. Uh, so to me, YouTube, I guess, has become a tool to avoid boring conversations. That's actually a very good one. I, have you found or have you been able to take some of the traction to like offline conversations? Do you engage with the followers? Do they engage with you? Because that's one thing as a very junior, not YouTuber, but you know, um, whatever it is, a person who puts their voice out there, that's one of the things that I'm experiencing. I get to speak. This introduction was made by, you know, Marcus from LinkedIn who said, you have to speak with Connor. He is absolutely the best. And I was like, wow, thanks, man. And so many of these interviews just came through word of mouth. So do, do you get the chance to speak, to communicate, to converse with your listenership, your audience? So, yeah, I've, we had 30,000 students at ESA over the last 18 years. And <laughs> you learn very quickly to identify um, lazy questions from curious, yep. interested questions. You know, a lazy question is, Connor, how do I learn to speak better? 
I go, uh, like, you know, if that's your question, uh, it's not even worthy of a response. If the question is, you know, Connor, I tried 16 different methods and I'm not sure whether method 15 or 16 is, is the best one for this particular context. Then I'll say, let's go have a coffee. Uh -huh. And you know, to me, yeah, I've often thought, how can I structure it that, that I avoid lazy comments and lazy questions? People that right. just haven't done the work. You know, they haven't done a Google search on their question and found that there's actually... 200 introductory guides. So, you know, where I see a question that you can see is not a lazy question. It is someone who is on the journey, they're doing the work, and they've got a sincere question from the trenches, from the work. That is when I stop and I dedicate plenty of time because that's what I'm interested in. And, you know, the, the answer to all questions as a business school professor is it depends. Hmm. You, know, you could do a whole career as a business school professor by scratching your chin and saying, hmm, hmm. great question. <laughs> it depends. Class, what factors does Michael's question depend on? On revenue, on this, on people, on trust? Hmm. How would we prioritize? Hmm. Hmm. It depends on the context. So, you know, you learn, and over 18 years of, of teaching in an MBA environment, you can distinguish self-serving questions from curiosity questions. You can distinguish someone who just hasn't done the basic homework from someone who is really doing the work and their question is going to be a valuable exploration from us both. And I think, you know, for me, I studied psychology at university and I love psychology. And the moment it gets into psychology, I'm interested and I'm engaged. You know, if it's, you know, Connor, how do I get something that's important to me? I, I'm probably not going to engage. Because if you'd ask a question like that, you're a very one-sided person in a relationship. You take. So, you know, I get a lot of requests for coffee. And in an email, you can tell, you know, it's, it's basically, Connor, I need a job. Right. And, you know, I, I can see, you know, if you said... Connor, I read your last article. There's two things that I think would make it even better. By the way, I need a job. I'll have coffee with you. But if it's outright, I need a job, I realize you're desperate. You're going to be desperate in two years, in five years. And until you learn to generate your own non-dependence on being saved, it's a waste of my life to save you. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, when I talk about as an entrepreneur, you need to learn about people. You need to learn to identify people who can stand on their own two feet and that they could do a great job without you, but something you have is going to magnify their impact by a hundred times. That's the person you want. If you hire someone who needs your help, you can only have six or seven of them around you and you're going to have no time left over for yourself all of your energy is into pulling them up day after day, week after week. And, you know, very often it's the fact that there exist good people trying to save people who are not willing to save themselves, that they can continue without learning the lesson. Hmm. You know, as an entrepreneur, if you wait to be saved, you're going to be a very poor entrepreneur. Uh, you need to build relationships where you give and you take, but it's in balance. And a trusted relationship doesn't mean you trust everyone. If you trust everyone, there's no trust. There has to be a decision over who is higher and who is lower on the pecking order of who gets the resources when you have or when you don't have. Uh, and you know, this prioritization is the hard part of life. Uh, I think Warren uh, Buffett tells a story where he had a pilot who worked for him and he was a pilot for six years and Warren got a bit frustrated because he likes to see, see people growing and taking on greater responsibility. And he could see that this guy was just doing the same job. So he said, Steve, um, you know, I've seen you've been with us for six years. You're flying. I'd like to, to know what, what you want to achieve. Would you take some time and write down the 20 most important things you'd like to achieve the rest of your life? 
And Steve, as a pilot, had a lot of time sitting around waiting. So he, he put a lot of work. And over six weeks, he created a list that had the 20 things that if he could achieve them before the end of his life, it would be a well-lived life. And he finally said, Warren, I've, I've got the list of 20. I've done the work. I've really worked on this. This is the 20 things that would really make my life a well-lived life. So Warren says, okay, now what I'd like you to do is identify the top five and, and take your time here. You know, really compare and contrast every single one so that you really know that the top five are the five most important. Uh, and Steve goes back and it takes another few weeks and really does the work. And he comes back and says, Steve, uh, Warren, I've got it. I've got the 20 and I've got the top five. So Warren says, great. What are you going to do with number six to 20? And Steve pauses and he thinks, well, you know, one to five are important and I'll work on those. But yeah, you know, six is still important. Seven is still important. So I guess, you know, I wouldn't make an effort, but if an opportunity came up, I'd take it. And Warren says, no, the reason that you will not achieve one to five is not Facebook, is not distraction. It's project six to 20. The thing that will stop you doing the five most important things in your life is not distraction. It's the six to 20th. It's the things that you can explain why there's a really good reason why you should take the opportunity. But you're going to destroy the time that you could take to really do what's important. That's and so incredibly smart. So laser focused. You know, I, I well, I'm going to put for a second here, I'm going to put myself with Warren for just you know, 15 seconds and say that coming into the MBA, I knew that I had such a gap that I put very strict parameters as to what I'm willing to spend my time on Yeah. in terms of people, in terms of focus areas and so on. And that has made all the difference. Connor, if you have two more minutes before we end, I wanted to play a very short game with you. And this game is called Only Three Words. And it goes like this. I'm going to ask you a question. You will think, you will say nothing, and when you say something, it can only be three words. So as an example, if I asked you, Connor, what are your three favorite colors, then you would think and say, oh, green, white, orange, obviously. Good on the game? <laughs> so, Connor, in only three words, based on your experience, your philosophy, your life, what are the three biggest barriers to personal success and development? Distraction, doubt, trying to think of the word that is the opposite of commitment. Hmm. So a word, so this, the barriers is committing, saying I'll do my best. Someone who says I'll do my best has given themselves a walkout clause because they can walk away in three months and say, I, I did my best. So the greatest barrier, uh, you know, distraction is there, but you can overcome it. Uh, doubt is there, but you can overcome it. The thing that we do that kills our potential to, to really have an impact in this world is to give 90%, to give, I, I'll do my best because I'll do my best. You'll always walk away when things get hard. Uh, I, I recruit people into my business and they're going to have probably the toughest year of their life over the next year in, in getting up and going and running a, a, a leadership mastermind group of CEOs. And 
you know, what I need to do in, in a series of conversations is get them to commit 100%, get them to have a look in their eyes that, you know, whether it takes a short time or a long time, whether it takes a hundred meetings or a thousand meetings, whether I'm able to do it right now or it's going to take time to learn, I am going to do this. And that every meeting they go into, the other person sees in their eyes that whether I say yes or no, this is going to happen. So many MBAs are looking for validation. And the toughest class that I teach is where I take away all validation of answers. I force you to stand on your own two feet and not look for anyone to agree with you, not look for anyone to say that you're right. Uh, and you know this career of doing what other people think is right, doing what other people think is impressive, doing what your parents think you should do, and not being able to, to decide there's something that is right for you and you don't need anyone to validate it and you don't need anyone to, to say it's there. And it's very hard to find this. And, and for me, when I say running, and, and not running to get fit, running to find a place of meditation, that time when I've been running for 30 minutes, when the noise has calmed down, when I've got through a bit of pain in my knees and I'm still going and the body's sort of on automatic, that's the moment when I remember what's important without needing validation from anyone else. And if I do that on mornings that I don't know what's important, that's when I come back and I realize what's important. And I think, you know, at age 20, you don't need that in your life. You can kind of just busyfy your way to a feeling of, of goodness. But uh, at some point along the path, you've got to stop being efficient and just pick a direction and don't worry whether you're going slow, fast, as long as you know that you don't need anyone's permission or anyone's validation. Something inside you lets you know that this work is what you're here to do. With those words those of wisdom words. and inspiration, <laughs> Connor, I would like to thank you very, very much. This was outstanding and educational and mainly fun. Thank you so much for your time, Connor. A pleasure. And Michael, we will keep talking. I know uh, Mikel Yado said that you were in touch. So uh, I look forward to hearing many good interviews with the professors from ESA over the next couple of weeks and months. Thank you, sir. Have a great Have one. A good one. Going to YouTube Live.